Hey everybody, I'm Lewis Bolden. In the past year, prices have gone up on lots of things, almost everything, even down to the clothes we wear. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, men's clothing has increased 14% year over year. If you eat at home or in restaurants, you've probably noticed the price of food has gone up. Chicken is up 10%, fish up 13%, pork 14.5%, and steak 17%. Even the cars we drive, we're paying more for. Used cars are up 40.5% year over year. New cars have gone up 12%. Rental cars, 29%. Even the gas we put in those cars has gone up 40%. And why has it all gone up? Inflation. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Solutionaries. In this episode, we're talking about inflation. We found creative problem solvers who are helping deal with astronomical gas prices. Other Solutionaries help us understand how e-bikes can be a solid alternative to cars. We'll see how to navigate soaring property costs and meet the people caring for seniors who are often limited financially. And how about the ports? Solutions to some major problems at the early stages of the supply chain. When great value is out, it's a problem. We're facing many problems, Come on. but we also see so many solutions. This is Solutionaries. Shipping is a big deal across the globe. Around 95% of the world's goods travel over the ocean. That's trillions of dollars worth every single year. This type of trade is nothing new. It dates back to centuries BC when merchants found it to be cheaper and faster than using land. From paddles to sails to steam, people have been using ships to move food, clothes and building supplies ever since. The world began using containers on ships in 1956. That sped up the process. Companies could pack a metal container once, put it on a vessel, then at the destination loaded onto a truck or a train, cutting costs significantly. Since then, ships have gotten longer than the Empire State Building is tall. A cargo ship can typically get from Europe to the U.S in about 10 to 12 days, from Asia to America in two to five weeks, depending on the coast. But it hasn't always been smooth sailing. Many ports are overwhelmed. There are too many ships in the ocean, with backups at the Suez and Panama canals. In the U.S., vessels have been backed up like never before because our demand for imported goods is outpacing the speed of shipping and the resources at ports, which leads to inflation. When you own a vegan restaurant, a beautiful array of madness, like Latasha Kaiser does, feeding people is what we do. Finding a substitute for what is already a substitute is difficult enough. Banana blossom, I use that for fish. Again, not in stock. And the supply chain shortage is making what is already a difficult job harder. So again, we have one can left that I am about to, after this, go try to find and track down banana blossom. Kaiser tried to find these items on wholesale. It was available when I ordered it, but by the time the truck was loaded, it was out of stock. Which means Kaiser is now paying the same price you or I would pay at the grocery store. Yes. And sometimes even the big box stores are out. When great value is out, it's a problem. Yeah. I'm being honest. Now this problem goes far beyond Crave Vegan's kitchen in a mall outside Jacksonville, Florida. When borders closed around the world in 2020, shipments of goods stopped. When businesses began reopening, demand returned. Cargo ships filled with items waited to be offloaded at ports, but there are not enough workers to unload them and not enough truckers to deliver to stores. The results? Economics 101. Demand outgrew the supply and costs keep going up. The price has 
tripled on many things, robust organic olive oil. We don't want to talk about what that case now looks like when it was, I'm just going to say it, it was 28 to 32. Now it's 55 to $65. And that is astronomically insane. The million dollar question, is there one solution to fix this supply chain issue? No, there is no one thing to fix it. But I think what I am saying is there are good things that are happening. They are happening in places like Savannah, Georgia. Of the Port of Savannah. At the 2022 Savannah State of the Port. At the helm of this conference, Georgia Port Authority Executive Director Griff Lynch. But there are solutions, there are ways we can help. Now the event is a way for the Georgia Port Authority to show off its accomplishments. And unlike many other ports around the country, Savannah's ports are doing something right. But that wasn't always the case. In October, like the rest of the country, Savannah's ports had up to 30 cargo ships waiting to offload at any given time. And how many do you have today? Zero. There are zero ships at anchor today. And it's not that the Port of Savannah is small. It's the third largest in the country, with plans to expand container capacity by 60% in the next three years. And for perspective, at the time we did this interview in February, it had zero ships waiting to offload. Portland had 18, South Carolina 34, and in California, more than 80. Part of our values is creativity, and that's inserting ourselves into the supply chain where necessary to find solutions. And one of the solutions to fixing this supply chain issue isn't actually on the water. You're gonna have to go further inland. Stacked like Legos, this is one of the six pop-up facilities across the Southeast owned by the Georgia Port Authority. In total, the Yards of Empty Land offers an additional 500,000 TEUs of annual container space. Now, TEUs are how cargo ships measure space. A standard 20-foot shipping container is one TEU. Now, most cargo ships hold between 10,000 and 21,000 TEUs, which means combined, these pop-up yards can fit as many as 50 cargo ships worth of containers. We need to provide our customers with more space because they have nowhere to send their cargo. Lynch explains between trucker shortages and a lag in ordering times, businesses aren't always ready to pick up their shipments when they get to the port. These pop-up yards offer a temporary home for the containers while creating more space at the port for other ships to offload. There are decisions and things we've done that will be part, a permanent part of our, our makeup moving forward as a result of the challenges we've had. But pop-up containers alone are not going to fix a worldwide supply chain issue. We are still up against it. We have zero ships at anchor today, but given the fact that there are many ports that are highly congested, customers are calling us, asking us if they can bring their ship to us. So we cannot handle 20 million TEUs, right? So we're building to get to seven and a half to nine million TEUs. Every port is a finite number. The nice thing about the Georgia Ports Authority is our expansion capability is unbelievable and unmatched. It's just a matter of how quickly can we build it. You need time. Time is the key. Every day a race against the clock to keep these ships moving. We're doing our best. And businesses open. Hi there. I want to talk to you about two important things. One is a gallon of gas and the other is a gallon of milk and how the cost of this gas and the cost of this milk are tied together. Let's talk about the gas first. There are lots of things that go into what a gallon of gas actually costs. Did you know that 10% of it is just for marketing and distributing all of that gas? Another 25%? 25% is for refining costs and for some profit. 22% is for taxes that are involved with a gallon of gas. But most of the cost of a gallon of gas is from crude oil. 43% of the cost you pay for a gallon of gas is because of what crude oil costs. And right now, crude oil is more expensive. It's a question of supply and demand, and there's a big issue with supply. Russia holds a lot of oil, and right now they're in a conflict with Ukraine. So supply is pretty tough and it's making everything more expensive, like this milk. This milk right here is more expensive because of this jug. This jug is made from plastic. Plastic is made from crude oil. It's more expensive to make the container, but not just the container, not just the milk, but also transporting it. Remember, a gallon of gas, a gallon of fuel, a gallon of diesel is more expensive right now. So everything's more expensive. 
it's not just gas and milk. Sugar right now is up 16%. Not just sugar, let's talk about corn. This corn right here is 37% more expensive. Everything is more expensive when a gallon of gas is more expensive. How expensive is gas right now? It really, really hurts. A lot of money. A lot? A lot of money. Ridiculous right now. Yeah, it's too expensive. We're in a market downturn. We may be headed toward harder times. I'm Bill Fulton. I'm the director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice University. I study cities and how they work. Historically, when gas prices go up, people start buying more fuel efficient vehicles. We've seen that we've seen that cycle over and over again. I think we are gonna see more and more people uh, switch to electric vehicles because of gas prices. Ha uh ha ha, gasoline's up to 319. More people will take a chance and try out an electric car. My name is Nan Hildreth. Shanoop Katari. This is my 2019 Chevrolet Bolt. It's a Tesla Model 3. Whether gas is $4 or $3 or $2.50 a gallon, the economics are so compelling. So no maintenance. I think it might be $10 to $12 of electricity a month that's that's being used to charge a vehicle. You put in gas and put in gas and put in gas, and that adds up. I'm paying the equivalent of 95 cents a gallon. They're a lot cheaper to fuel. To switch to an electric vehicle, electric vehicles are still quite expensive. It's driving itself. Going about my first Tesla, absolutely unaffordable for the average consumer. Um, but as we are progressing now, the cost of ownership is getting much, much lower. I said, I'll give you 29.9 tax title and license everything. And they said, it's the end of the year and we're still stuck with this. <laughs> okay. This is one of the ironies about gas prices going up. A lot of families of modest means uh, it's a burdensome for them to own one or more cars to get around. They don't make very much money. So to switch to an electric vehicle is probably beyond their means. I'm not sure about the electric. I'm not sure the usage or how that would be more effective. But for me, riding a bus is very effective. When gas prices go up, we always see public transit usage go up. My name is Michelle Johnson. I've been using Metro since uh, I was 17. At one point in my life, it was like that. Do I get gas or food? I figured that the bus, uh, you know, it takes me essentially where I need to go when I need to, but it's not that simple for a lot of people. It's not really that simple because bus service is less frequent in the evenings. I'm Jonathan Brooks. I am Link Houston's Director of Policy and Planning. Bus routes tend to end around between 8 p.m. and about 1 a.m. It, it depends where you are. And so if you're a second or third shift worker, you might be able to take the bus to work, but it can be difficult to get home on the bus. My son is Brandon Johnson. He doesn't have a car. He works from like four to 10. So he was using Uber and it was very expensive. And he said, mom, I need to change. I'm spending too much money on Uber. And Metro thought about that and had a conversation with the community and came up with what they call the cashmere late night connector. Well, what do you just see a cab and you get in it? Essentially, Metro pays for quite a few cabs to be accessible already. This is the late night connector. He calls them. Hello. And they pick him up and they take him straight to the house. We're not opposed to people driving, but we think people should have options to walk, bike, roll, and use transit. It's a matter of identifying what the community would like to see change and then getting the minimal resources necessary to really implement it. pandemic recession, when car prices jump to their highest levels ever. Cities are adapting to a different lifestyle and a different way of thinking.
Since the start of the pandemic, prices for used and new cars went sky high. It's because of something small that caused a big problem. We're talking about these little guys right here. Semiconductor chips. When the materials to make them became harder to get, mostly overseas, they couldn't make chips anymore. And these do everything from fuel efficiency to making your car drive to making sure you have power windows. But prices went up more than we'd expect with just supply chain problems. That's because dealerships were also inflating the prices themselves. So much so that manufacturers like General Motors called the practice unethical. So there you have it. Supply chain problems with chips and dealership price gouging is causing inflation in cars. Take a look at this graph from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The blue line is new cars, and the red line is used. Those shaded areas, those are recessions. You can see things stayed relatively steady most of the time for new cars, used cars a little less, but still pretty even until here after the pandemic recession, when car prices jumped to their highest levels ever. And that led to another interesting rise. The number of people buying electric bikes or e-bikes. It really introduced me to alternative transportation at the time. I'm Jason Hall with Ride Detroit and Electric Avenue Bikes Detroit. Jason spent years leading the group Slow Roll Detroit, a group of urban bike riders that gained national attention before he left to start a company giving e-bike tours of his city. There's even one where you stop at all of his favorite pizza joints. But he wasn't sold on them right away. You know, I had all these misconceptions in my mind, like you had to be overweight or you had to be disabled. So I looked at them and I said, why would you think I needed that, man? I was like offended. I said, I ride my bike. And they said, no, take it out for the weekend. Try this thing out. Open your mind. And that's one of the key things I tell people all the time about these. E-bikes are becoming some of the hottest selling ways to get around, outpacing the sales of both electric and hybrid cars combined in the U.S. in 2021. And it's not hard to see why. E-bikes can start as low as $1,600, while the average price of a used car has hit more than 41000 Why do you think people are switching from cars to e-bikes? I think there's a couple different reasons. I mean, I, there's the obvious gas dependency. You know, um, when you get an e-bike, you're, you're not dependent on that anymore. You, you're, you have a lot more freedom. But I think a lot more people are moving to cities and, 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 and into commutable situations. You know, in the old days, I mean, we're from the Motor City. So it, everything in Detroit was set up, even if it was to go to the grocery store that were blocks away, they really set up ways to make it hard for you to do that unless you got in your car. Where now cities are adapting to a different lifestyle and a different way of thinking. Do you think it's weird that sort of this e-bike revolution is happening in the Motor City where we've built our lives in this whole city around cars? Uh, you know, yes and no. You know, Detroit's always been a bike city. You know, one of the first roads that were built for bikes were built in Detroit. So we talk about the Motor City, and that was really an era in Detroit, but we've always been a wheeled city. But there are some drawbacks for people with long commutes who have to be out in the weather. They also don't go as fast as most road speeds, and a lot of cities aren't set up to have bikes with very few bike lanes, not to mention they work better in urban areas as opposed to more rural places. But Jason thinks maybe these bikes are just ahead of their time, especially if those car prices are here to stay. I often say that they're the bike of the future, but they're really the bike of now. It's not just e-bikes. I mean, you look around, you've got e-scooters, you've got all kinds of alternative transportation. I think people are just ready to do something new. What is inflation? According to the Federal Reserve, inflation is the increase in prices for products and services over a period of time. That's the simple answer. Now, depending on who you ask, there are different types of inflation. But to keep it simple, I'll talk about the main three. There is demand pull inflation. When the demand for goods or services is higher when compared to the production capacity. This is basic supply and demand. 
When the demand is high and supply is low, prices go up. Then there is cost push inflation. This is when the cost of production increases. So when the materials to create a product increase, the cost of the product increases. There is also built-in inflation. Expectation of future inflations results in built-in inflation. A rise in prices results in higher wages to afford the increased cost of living. So high wages result in increased cost of production, which in turn has an impact on product pricing. If it sounds like a dog chasing its tail, it kinda is. That's inflation. You know, my father moved here seven, almost seven years ago. It'll be seven years of renewal this year. So we just try to make it as easy as possible to move somewhere local and somewhere that was affordable. What was your rent when you moved in? 780 a month. And Sean Zwifka says he and his father have seen their rent rise about 10% each year over those seven years. This year though, take a look at this. His renewal jumped from $995 a month to $1,645, a 65% increase. When you opened this, what went through your mind? Originally, my father that lives with me got the note first, and he called me, and he said, you won't believe what happened, man. You gotta come home. My, my median income is very low, and unfortunately, I work at a local credit union, and it just seems to get worse and worse. Unfortunately, it doesn't get any better for us. It's sad because my dad is 68 years old, served in the military, you know what I mean? For eight years and is honorably discharged and disabled. And it's just sad when I can tell my dad, like I'm trying everything I can right now, man, but it just ain't enough. It's sad. It's a lot to, it's a lot to shoulder by at 30, yourself. At 30 years old, I never thought I'd, I would be coming to the point where I feel like I'm coming homeless. To the point where my income doesn't match what I can afford. Zwifka and his father are not the only ones seeing their rent rise. Zwifka's neighbors in his Orlando 32808 zip code have seen their rent go up more than 40% over the last year. In the state of Florida, it's gone up an average of 30%. And across the nation, renters are seeing an increase of about 14%. That's more than the rate of inflation. So what can be done about these sharp rises in rent? Well, we came here to Tallahassee, the state capital of Florida, where we found one legislator is working on a solution, but it's controversial. My name is Anna V. Escamani, and I'm proud to serve as a state house representative for District 47. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are you the Florida representative Escamani? There's a strange dichotomy that many of us sit in between feeling invisible and feeling invincible. I am a renter. Yeah, I've been a renter um, ever since I moved out and uh, have served in legislature. So, and I, I've moved um, a few times, uh, but right now I live in Thornton Park and I have uh, two roommates. So because... it even takes roommates for you to make your rent. Correct, yeah. Looking for a solution, Escamani and Florida State Senator Victor Torres have filed identical bills to repeal a law that blocks cities and counties from establishing rent control measures. What our repealer does is it doesn't automatically, you know, grant rent stabilization across the state, but it does say that a local government will have an option to explore this when there's a housing emergency which I would argue right now we're in. We told her about Zwifka and his father. He just got his renewal notice. His rent is going up from $995 a month to $1,645 a month. Unbelievable. That's unbelievable. So, you know, given this man's predicament, yeah. is this something that your bill, if approved, could help? Oh, 100%, yeah, because if, so, if our bill was passed, then the city of Orlando, for example, could declare a state of housing emergency and they could put rent stabilization programs and say that during this time frame, you cannot increase rent by X percentage. Proposed referendum uh, for a one year rent freeze. And In Orlando, Orange County commissioners considered declaring that emergency and freezing rent for a year. 
But the county's attorney there advised them against it because of the law that Escamani is trying to undo. I'm concerned about, you know, the, the wording of emergency. That's why I asked that question earlier. The city what of St. Petersburg also like grappled with um, declaring that emergency for months, but they decided to hold off. We are at the Orlando Union Rescue Mission in Orlando, Florida. My name is Stephanie Johnson. Some days it's good, some days it's hard, you know. It's not easy accepting your situation at all times, but you know you gotta get through it, so you do. And it's here in this small room at the Orlando Union Rescue Mission two, two, two. that Stephanie Johnson and her two daughters have lived in for the past two years. This is my bed. Larea sleeps at the top, Michelle sleeps at the bottom, if she's not in my bed. Um, Larea actually loves to do art projects, so these are all her art projects. Johnson's case manager here helped her get assistance that paid for community college, which helped her establish a career. Now, more assistance is helping her skip rent altogether and jump from homeless to homeowner. I was ready to hit the ground running. <laughs> I didn't want to hit the brakes. I wanted to keep the excitement. I wanted to keep that positivity going so that that dream could be a reality. That dream came in the form of Orange County's Down Payment Assistance Program. It's like similar programs run by cities and counties across the country. Federal and state funds are used to help qualified first-time home buyers with a down payment and closing costs. Here, it's a maximum of $45,000. Generations of watching my family grow up, like nobody really owns a home. Everybody rents or has an apartment, so it's looking at your life and accepting, you know, what you see in front of you and not trying to challenge yourself for more. Um, so coming here gave me time to sit down and think about where do I want to be in five years from now and definitely not renting somebody else's house. And her future. At this point, anywhere, which wasn't a, a thought that I could have before, but now my oldest daughter wants to go to China one day and that's actually possible in my mind now. So. It's done a lot more than just get me a house, so it's giving me a home. Mitch, I'll have you sit over here. And who else is going to be signing? Uh, I will be, yes. I'm Paul. Nice to meet you. Paul and Lissandra and Domenico are closing on their new home after renting for years. Our last largest increase was probably about a $500 increase, right, per month. And they say that was the last straw. You know what, we're probably paying more renting than we would be if we actually owned it. They found a way to make that happen. And it's right here. They found the Neighborhood Assistance Corporation of America, or NACA for short. The folks here say that they can help anybody buy a home no matter what their income is or what their credit score may look like. They pay the down payment, they pay the closing costs, and a lot of times they find interest rates that are below the market rate. Before you can qualify, though, you have to go through NACA's right. financial management counseling, which includes creating monthly budgets and establishing a savings plan. So this is for you to take with you as well. That the Indomenicos completed it, and we were there at the closing. Congratulations. I on their you. new home. I, I tell you, <laughs> he did it all. He put his glasses on, and he wasn't that computer, oh, they sent me this, and, and I need to submit this, like I need to submit this, like ASAP, like right now. Welcome. And here's the result of that paperwork, a three bedroom home in a gated community in suburban Orlando. It's exciting. We have to do a little bit of construction, or maybe a little bit more, but it's very exciting. This is it, we did it. Overall, fuel, fertilizer, labor, labor, your total savings for the year. If everything goes as planned, it'll be at least $10,000 at a minimum. Maybe, you know, pushing $15,000. Community gardens are very popular now, so popular that cities like Roanoke, Virginia are now spending money to add more. 
There are a number of ways community gardens can work. At one, you can rent a small plot for $30 a year. The organization running the garden can help provide the compost, tools, donated seeds, and more. You plant what you want and then get to harvest what you grow. But the space is small, so you're limited to how much you can grow. Another model, you grow as a community together in a larger space where you can grow a larger amount of food. You could have fruit and nut trees and traditional garden rows. Community gardens also have volunteer days to help clean, weed, and prep for the next season. We didn't come up with the idea. You know, we, we saw someone else's resourcefulness and said, hey, let's implement it here. We've got to find a way to make this to where I can show someone in a very short period of time how to do it. This is another unprecedented time in American history where I really think we should be focused on gardening again. I do think it's a, it's a lot more people are interested in this because they want to uh, secure that for their family with, with uncertain economic times. The cost of ground beef two years ago, how much would you sell it for? Two years ago, we were right around, I think, six fifty a pound. And now? Now we're at $7 a pound, so it's gone up a little bit, but we've really tried to, to mitigate that cost as much as possible. What people are seeing in the grocery stores has been a lot more than that, I think, um, and, and the demand's been driven up as well. So we don't want to be victims in this scenario, so we are trying to be very proactive and, okay, what can we do to manage cost, still keep it affordable? We have a nice uh, sirloin steak right there. Um, a nice uh, beef roast. When we're talking inflation or food inflation in particular, a meat share is the best way to do it because you're going to get buy it in bulk, you're going to get a variety of cuts, and that meat's going to last you for a long time. It gives you know people like okay, if I, yeah, there's a there's a there's an upfront cost, but the dollar the price per pound goes down substantially when you buy it in bulk like that. You get a variety of cuts, and you have a longer shelf life. Um, because it stays frozen and it stays back in still. So you want to get in underneath and find the roots down here. I'm the community gardens manager with LEAP uh, for local food. We've really been trying to figure out what to do here actually and how to shift this space to being more productive and more useful. Have you ever been to a community garden before? No. So tell me about your thought when you walked up today. I mean, it looked kind of messy and like it needed a lot of work. We're taking out a lot of like the chicken wire that's like all messed up and taking out the old boards and putting in new ones. Have you seen an increase in community gardens? Absolutely. These gardens have been at capacity for the last two years. Um, there's a variety of gardening groups that have been springing up around the city um, and in the area. Everybody focused on food resiliency. How do we grow more in our community? And are we seeing that as a result of inflation, as a result of not being able to get things that we would normally get because of the pandemic? I think so. Just learning more about nature and, and that resiliency. And this is a part of our heritage. There's a lot of different ways to develop community gardens. And this, this is one model here. But the limitation here is you have this giant tree yeah. with the shade. You are locked into this space because we have a lot of buildings around us. So you can only grow so much right here. That's right. So when you're growing your own garden in your backyard or community gardens like this, how are you fighting inflation? I think about it like I don't have to worry about how the national economy is doing to make sure that I'm putting food on my plate and for my family. I do think it's a, it's a lot more people are interested in this because they want to uh, secure that for their family with, with uncertain economic times. Yeah, so we're going to go up to one of the fields, set out all the bales of hay um, about a month in advance, which really limits my tractor time or tractor time in general, and also limits the need for additional help and labor. The term is called bale grazing, where you have the rings around the hay bales. This is the, the hay rings that we have. They're just a high density plastic. They're very light. What we're looking for is from a labor perspective is something that's not incredibly difficult, something that we can save time with and, and doesn't require us having to use a lot of equipment. You're going to move those? Yeah, I'm going to move those rings over. Okay. So one of the things I should mention is, 
So why do we put the rings out as opposed to just letting them get at it? Well, <clears throat> this preserves the bale as much as possible. Um, and because of that, see, when cattle lie in it or step in it, they don't want to eat it. It'd just be like you taking your foot and stepping in your food and then be like, I don't know if I really want to eat that, right? So if we can preserve the integrity of the bale so that only their heads can reach it and keep them out of it, then they'll consume the whole bale. Hay can be quite expensive, whether you're making it or buying it, it can be quite expensive. So if we're gonna make the investment of hay and making it, we wanna preserve that as much as possible and actually let it be food for them as opposed to being uh, bedding. We're regularly looking for ways to, to improve things. And okay, how do we make it more efficient? How do, and so um, when we kind of saw some of the inflationary stuff going, we are like, all right, there's gonna be some changes in, into the ag community that the ag business or, or farming community is not gonna be able to avoid. We are making efforts to be more efficient. And so um, that's how we came up with the idea. And when we said, okay, well, we've got electric fence and we've got some of these things already in place. Let's use that to our advantage to, to greatly reduce our our overhead costs, right? Labor, fuel, fertilizer. I mean, those are kind of like the three things that cost any farm operation quite, can, can be quite substantial. Come on. I can spread them out, get them to traverse back and forth. Now I've got manure spread and I still have grass on the ground. And so manure and urine now is gonna act as my fertilizer. So back. overall, fuel, fertilizer, labor. labor. Your total savings for the year if everything goes as planned, it'll be at least $10,000 at a minimum, maybe, you know, pushing $15,000. Just like any business, right? And when you can reduce the amount of inputs, right? And it's a large percentage of, of those inputs to make your product. Now your products can be far more affordable to the consumer that you're, that you're targeting. Delivering furniture or even more than mowing a yard. It's bringing value not just to them, but to their property. The pandemic, supply and labor shortages, global tension, so many contributors to inflation, which impacts all of us, some more than others. Our seniors, for example, many on fixed incomes, many carrying more debt than ever before. Households led by someone aged 65 to 74 carrying 14% more debt than someone of the same age did in 1989. A Harvard report revealed housing costs burdened seniors are still paying 30% or more gross income on housing costs. Solutions exist. They may not be perfect, but one of the most effective, sustainable ways older people are getting help is from caring people and groups that provide food and other resources. They also provide hope and a reminder of the support, compassion, and goodwill that make our community what it is, a city that continues to step up to help those in need. We help the folks that are 65 and older and that are living at or below the poverty level. And so imagine living on $800, needing to buy groceries, medications, pay your utilities, trying to maintain your home or insurance or whatever else we have. And so, so for us, what we really felt is we want to help the elderly be able to maintain their independence and stay at home as long as they can, right? As an example, every year we will actually choose the home of one of our seniors, usually the one that needs it the most, and Robert will go ahead and sit down and evaluate what's it gonna take. You do have a friend. Yeah. Whether it's delivering diapers or delivering furniture or even mowing, mowing a yard, it's bringing value not just to them but to their property you know to the to our dying breath we should be able to feel that we're loved and cared for and that we're important so that's how we're we're trying to turn around um, cause a paradigm shift so to speak that that the elderly have value you know because one day uh, unless we pass away beforehand you know we'll all get there Thank you.
Thank you.